Welcome to our time of worship. God is with us. He greets us with his love and grace. Welcome to all of you as we're here to be renewed in God's love and to live out his love in the world. A special welcome if you're a guest with us this morning. We're so glad you could be with us. And I invite you to stand and receive God's greeting as we begin our time of worship. God's love accompanies us. Receive his grace now. Grace Mercy and peace be to you in the name of our God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we greet one another as God has greeted us. We are returning to the Sermon on the Mount. We started that at the beginning of the year and took a detour to the book of Judges and then Holy Week. We're back to um, Matthew 5 to 7 and today we hear that call to live as righteous people. And it's really vital that we remember God alone and God first and foremost is the righteous one. These words from Psalm 33 celebrate that and help us to worship our God who is righteous. For the word of the Lord is right and true and he is faithful in all that he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of his unfailing love. May we worship this faithful and righteous God.
Jesus tells us, blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake. I struggled with that one this week. What does it look like for us to live in a world with righteousness? The statement we're going to say together comes from what's called Our World Belongs to God. It's a contemporary testimony. It's a little old now because it was first written in 1987, and it gets kind of updated uh, to stay kind of contemporary. But this is a picture as we say these words that I think gives us a good picture of what it looks like to gather to be a righteous people, how this takes a tangible shape in our lives. So let us say these words today, and hopefully they will carry with us as we go from this place in a little while into the world. Let us say these words together. The church is a gathering of forgiven sinners called to be holy. Saved by the patient grace of God, we deal patiently with others and together confess our need for grace and forgiveness. Restored in Christ's presence, shaped by his life, this new community lives out the ongoing story of God's reconciling love, announces the new creation, and works for a world of justice and peace. Inviting our kids to come up. Not a lot today, but we got some still. And I'm going to sit here, and you can sit by me so you can see. I've got a book. If you can sit close enough to see the book. And today, we're going to hear in this Bible says, and this is good, and this helps remind the adults where we are because. We started with this when it was winter and cold, and now it's kind of getting, I think it's hot. It's warm, at least, and so it's been a little bit. We're called, this is called the Sermon on the Mount. Can you guys say that with me? The Sermon on the Mount. Where's Jesus in here in this picture? Yeah. He's easier to find than Waldo, isn't he? <laughs> Do you guys know who Waldo is? Okay. That's good. <laughs> Makes me feel good about something, at least. So Jesus 
took his disciples up into the hills and he taught them about God's kingdom. And this is how he began. And here's what we're hearing today. Blessings on you when you are poor in spirit. The kingdom of God will be yours. Blessed are you when you mourn. That means you're sad. And you'll be comforted. Blessed are you when you are humble and lowly. The earth will be yours. Blessings on you when you hunger and thirst for God's justice you will be satisfied. Blessings on you when you are kind and merciful. Kindness and mercy will be yours. Blessings on you when you are pure in heart, for you will see God. Blessings on you when you are peacemakers, and you will be called the children of God. Jesus taught his followers that God loves everyone, and his people should love everyone as well. And that means forgiving people just as God forgives. God wants his people to talk to him as they would talk to a loving father. And they should trust God for everything. And he taught them how to pray. And this is the prayer that he gave. Maybe this will sound familiar. Father in heaven, may your name be honored. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the bread we need for today. And forgive us the wrongs we have done as we forgive those who have wronged us. Don't let us fall into temptation, but rescue us from evil. And then Jesus ended his teaching with a warning. Following his teachings, he said, would be like building house on a rock. Doing anything else would be like building house on sand. The wind and the rain would come and knock it down and wash it away. So I'm hoping and praying that we would listen, and you can see, can you see the picture up here? That we would be like this house on the rock, and see this house up here in the picture? And it's kind of washing away, isn't it? It's just hard to imagine a house kind of floating away, but that's what Jesus says. If, if you're going to follow other teaching that's not my teaching, it's going to be bad. And you can see, can you see the house cracking and crumbling? So let's pray, and some of us will stay here, and some of us go to walk out worship. But let's pray that we would hear Jesus teaching and know that it's lovely and good and it's the best thing for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your teaching. Today we hear just a little bit of it, and it takes a lot for us to get into our hearts. So we ask that you, by your Holy Spirit, put your teaching in our hearts and our minds and that we live it out, all of us, young and old, as we listen here in the church to your word and as we go to walk out worship. Help us listen and do what you, we are taught by you, Jesus. We love you and thank you. Amen. Amen. Good job. Thanks for being great listeners. You guys know where to go. I think everyone knows where they're going, right? Walk out worship that away. And Isaac's a big guy now, so. <laughs> okay. We did the Beatitudes, blessed are, and they just had one left. Always plan stuff at the beginning of the year, and plans change. It was going to get all finished up and then go to Lent, but it didn't go that way. So we are going to finish that one now, and then we're going to continue for a little while with those teachings of Jesus, which I've never preached before. And I always ask, hey, when, when was the last time it's been done here? It's been long enough. I've been here now six years, so been at least that long, so hopefully we'll hear some familiar words of Jesus, but they will be fresh, challenging, and powerful as we continue to hear uh, really the heart of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5 to 7. So the last of these, and it does kind of expand um, rather than just one statement, Jesus continues with just this one, and this wraps it up. And I'm going to spend a lot more time on the righteousness aspect today versus the persecuted aspect you could do a sermon on both. I think there's a good conversation about persecution. Um, but I think we're also aware that we don't suffer persecution like many other Christians in the world today or, or throughout history. It's not easy, but it's not as awful as it could be. But righteousness is clear, and it's hard. And it's hard for us to see what that means. So may God bless his reading of his word today. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. In the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So friends, in Jesus Christ, just a quick recap. At the beginning of this series, uh, I shared an illustration or way to think about this, and this is really helpful for me, that uh, the Sermon on the Mount is sort of like what the Constitution is to the United States. It's like the Constitution of the church. And uh, the first part, this blessed are, these beatitudes, the front part of the Sermon on the Mount, are almost like what the preamble in the Constitution are. And I won't read the whole thing, but that's the part, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. I don't have musical talent, but I appreciate music. And in a big symphony, there's often the overture, which gives you kind of almost like the big picture. It's like both a table of contents and a sampler. And that's what these beatitudes are. They function as telling us the rest of the story, but also setting the tone for the entire Sermon on the Mount. And I'm sure you've noticed, uh, I know it's been a little while, but before even a sermon series came along, as you've read these, maybe you had a lesson on them or you took them to heart, you notice the Beatitudes really flip everything upside down. It's right side up in God's kingdom, but it's upside down in our world. It's very different. It's against the grain or upstream. It's just not normal or natural. All these things are kind of a surprise when you think of them. Like, blessed are you, happy are you, flourishing are you when you mourn. That's a great example. Now, if you were to ask me before I preach this series, what's the Sermon on the Mount about? I, I could have told you, well, it's in Matthew 5 to 7. I could have told you, well, it's the heart of Jesus teaching. I would have said something, I'm trying to keep it brief, what's my elevator speech? Jesus is like the new Moses in the same way Moses comes on a mountain with the Ten Commandments. Jesus is on a mountain and he's giving new instruction. It's to a Jewish audience, is Matthew's emphasis. Uh, I would have said, this is a picture of Jesus fulfilling the law. And you hear that saying, uh, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And so Jesus is fulfilling and he's taking it right to the heart. But here's one thing I would have missed. And I'm glad I get to preach and teach and share these things and learn myself. Righteousness. That's a really big deal in Matthew 5 to 7. Righteousness is a really big theme in the Sermon on the Mount. I, I don't know if I would have um, said that until I started preaching these. You see it in what I've called that preamble of the Beatitudes. Twice it's mentioned. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. They long for righteousness. And we covered that one, and I'll reiterate a couple points. And blessed are those who suffer because, because, well, they're doing it. They're living it, righteousness. And that won't be the end of righteousness, so I had to decide how much do I say today. I can spend a little more later on righteousness, but just to give you a heads up of what else is coming, Jesus tells you, and I'm going to kind of make this part of the frame today, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. And that's in Matthew 5, verse 20, so not far from here. Or this one, and I'm sure some of you maybe have memorize this at some point or you know it's a biggie and jesus talking about worrying matthew 6 seek first the kingdom and his meaning god's and righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well make that your pursuit make that your worry not your stuff not your clothes not your money spend your energy focusing on righteousness so it's clear righteousness you have to do it we have to live it. We have to be and do, and we have to live out righteousness. It's not just, oh, I, I like that idea. I know what it means. Yeah, God's righteous. Cool. No, we, we have to be righteous as well. It's our pursuit. It's our life. First, you long for it. So for some of us, that's an attitude adjustment or re recalibration in our priorities. I need to make righteousness more of a, more of a priority. And then second, well, it's got to be what I hunger and thirst for, if you think of it like food and drink, um, it's got to metabolize. I've, I've got to use that hunger and thirst, and, and I've got to take God's righteousness in, and, and that's got to be my fuel for life. I've got to live it. You've got to be righteous. 
And this is the very point we get into trouble. We have to be righteous. We can quickly then say, okay, I've got to do this. I've got to try harder. And it's sort of this performative thing. I, I got to do this better. I've got to try harder. And even as you hear hunger and thirst, well, I've got to, I've got to do this. Jesus, and I read that passage, you've got to have a righteousness that's passing the Pharisees. And I'll preach that in a little bit, but let me just say as we talk seriously about living righteousness, and I'll probably echo this again, it's helpful. Jesus is not telling us to out-Pharisee the Pharisees. Look at them and see how serious they are and be better, be more serious. Uh, it's not about trying harder to do better. And so as I say that, uh, that's kind of a disclaimer, I, I hope for all of us that either brings a sense of relief. Whew. Oh, good. I don't have to try so hard. And, or, it's probably both, <laughs> repentance. I need to stop. I need to stop trying so hard to be righteous. It's not about me trying harder. It's probably a mix of both for all of us. Sort of, uh, I don't have to do this. Thank you, God. I don't have to try so hard. Help me, God. <laughs> Relief and repentance in one. And if you take it a step further, well, I think you remember this part of the Bible. We can't be righteous. That's what Romans 3 is all about. This really tension, and I kind of grapple with this tension this morning. Paul says, a lot like what we've heard from judges, you remember that line about people? They did what was right in their own eyes, and you quickly could tell it's not right in God's eyes. This time, it's not just a people in Israel. Those people back then, Paul says in Romans 3, it's all of us, every single one of us. None of us can be righteous. None of us can do righteousness. It's an everyone at all times statement. There was no one who is righteous, not even one. There was no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away, he says, and together has become worthless. There is no one that does good, not even one. And thanks be to God, that's not how that chapter ends. As Paul will continue, he tells us that God gives to us a righteousness. This is a gift that comes. It's grace. It's free. You can't conjure this up or try hard enough, but God's going to give it to you. It's a free gift in Jesus Christ. That's a good way to think of Jesus Christ. That's the righteousness of God made real in our lives. He comes and brings it. He comes and shares it. He comes and the old language is imparts it or bestows it. He kind of clothes us with it. As Paul will continue, uh, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. And there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. So for everyone, none of which can be righteous, not just Jewish people, but everyone, they can have this righteousness in Jesus. And here's probably maybe the most famous line of Romans 3. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and then the good news, and are freely justified by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. So back in the, the sermon on hungry and thirsting for righteousness, in my mind, this was helpful, and I hope it was for you. I said, if we think about righteousness for us, there's kind of two parts of our lives that it gets applied. First, it's personal. And this is the part I was just talking about. God gives it to us. It's this gift. This is the grace part. This is the salvation part. But the second part, and that's kind of what I want to talk about for us today, is the purposeful. Personal and purposeful. Like you've got to live this out. Two completely different aspects, but you can't have one without the other. You can't be purposeful without having received this grace. And if you receive this grace, you can't just say, cool, I'm going to just hold this for myself. You've got to live. You've got to live out this righteousness. So if you to ask me, well, what does righteousness in a personal way mean? Well, it means to be right with God. I hi highlighted the Heidelberg Catechism, and I won't do that again, but if you want to look, it's 60 and 61, and it's this gift of God as if I've never sinned, and all I do is receive it by faith. You might remember that echo through the generations. 
So if you think of it this way, as a personal way, in the only audience that matters, when God looks at, at you, he knows your personality, he knows your quirks, he knows your temperament, he knows your habits, he knows those sins that maybe nobody else knows about. But when he looks at you, he sees Jesus Christ. It's not that he's oblivious to everything else, but this is how God chooses to look at you, and that's the personal part. Righteousness is deeply personal. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus Christ. But let's talk about the purposeful part. In the personal aspect, when God sees us, he sees Jesus Christ. So if we ask, what's like the purposeful then? It would be asking the question, well, what does everyone else see? And I think that's a helpful way to think of it. If God looks at us and sees Jesus Christ, the purposeful living and being righteous, then would ask, well, what does the world see? How do they experience me and us? What do they see? Jesus points out, and just kind of recapping, and got to land this whole Beatitudes thing too, a flourishing life. Thriving and flourishing were kind of two words I've used. You all know, I think, before this sermon series that blessed, and when we translate it in the modern language, it'd be happy, and uh, happy doesn't quite capture it. Blessed is a, a word that is hard, just kind of feels wide open, and, and happy just feels maybe a little sentimental, but thriving and flourishing, thriving and flourishing are the humble poor, flourishing and thriving in the grace of God are, are those who seek and create peace, shalom, we heard that word. So, Jesus is saying it's a certain kind of character. It's a certain attitude. It's not all just habits. It has some habits, but it's a deeper quality of life. Of course, the heart of which is loving God, and you got to love yourself, and loving others. You experience, so people experience that kind of righteousness in you. Again, Jesus isn't calling us to be a better version of the Pharisees. Try harder, be better, but be something different altogether. So, do people encounter in you a, a good religious resume? Think about that. Um, most of us, if we think about the Christian life, and I've got, a, I've got a big list here, and I'll go through it quickly. But if we think about quality of life in the Christian life, how's your Christian life going? If I were to ask this, an elder, just in a kind of conversation, here's some of the things we would think about. Assuming Jesus says, blessed are you, thriving are you, when? And here's a list. I'm just kind of every one of those think of Jesus saying, thriving, flourishing are you, when? You're reading your Bible and praying daily. Devotional, quiet time, we call those things. Attending church regularly, worship. Regularity is not what it used to be. You're a church member. The longer the better, charter members, special badge of honor, those who tithe, blessed are those who know a lot about the Bible, maybe some theology, blessed are those who know their spiritual gifts and use them, blessed are those who exercise spiritual disciplines, blessed are those who are in church councils, blessed are those who lead a ministry, blessed are those who lead us in worship, happy are those who are leading uh, or th evangelizing, thriving are those who have a great testimony, ideally a dramatic conversion in my world. Thriving are those who preach well. You might add important roles like the Council of Delegates. Maybe thriving are you if you wrote a Today devotional or something like that, you know, something kind of public that shows off your spirituality. Here's some other categories to think about old school and what you guys lived with in the 20th century. Those of you who avoid the ways of the world, so maybe you still don't dance, play cards, or go to movies. You don't swear, smoke, or drink. Maybe those are categories. We could think of these, and kind of these last ones are just, you know, not Christian exclusive, but they're blessed, and we honor them, and Revere them, respect them. Blessed are those who serve in public councils or important Christian things like school boards. Those are good things, you know. Blessed are those who have a successful business. And we might even preface it with he's a good Christian businessman or good Christian businesswoman. Those who serve in the military. You could kind of add, I think, to the list. You get the idea. We think of those as the good life, <laughs> the thriving, the flourishing life. And not one of those things I mentioned is bad. 
Not at all. In fact, they, they're good. They should be. They ought to be. They have that capacity. Uh, those last couple ones I said, um, they're not exclusive to being a Christian, but we respect them, esteem them. They're good things, but, but, if any one of those things begets, begins to get too important, we know what we call that, an idol. And an idol, by its sort of definition, my favorite definition is a distorted love. You either love the wrong thing, or you love the right thing, but just not in the right way, in the wrong way. It's gotten a little too big, and the love is out of whack, you might say, in kind of everyday language. If any one of these things justifies your existence, I am, and that's kind of, you know, the first, foremost way you imagine and vision yourself, your vision for life. That's when it's a problem. And, and, this is an important way to put it, this is where you begin to get self, self-righteous. There's such a fine line between righteous and self-righteous, and that's kind of the tension I want you all to struggle with. I struggle with so much. Again, and I'm going to probably pick on these guys because Jesus kind of does. The Pharisees, they're very self-conscious about doing the right thing in the right way. And that's not bad. Where they really run into problems, for sure, where I know they're stepping over the line and it's become too important is they want everyone else to see. And no, we're in the right. I'm right with God. It's weird, but we can do this. We can take that personal very lovely, beautiful, are belonging to God, but then become sort of entitled and smug and condemning and condescending and just mean. <laughs> the grace of God then just makes us a nasty. It's not meant to be that way, but we begin to think of ourselves as special. The problem with the Pharisees, they did a lot of God stuff, but the inner dimensions, their character was still flawed. It didn't shape their heart or their soul. We know from just, we get a good sample of how they behaved with perhaps Nicodemus being the exception because God got to him. Love is not only absent, but in its place has become hate and judgment. So they're doing so many of the right things. And I bring all this up because I want to kind of hammer home for us. We need a better measuring stick than a Christianized Pharisee list. All those things are important that I just mentioned, and I want and wish many of those, most of those things for you, at least the first few that I rattled off. These are things that help you grow in grace, or they should. So we don't want to play the Pharisee game with a Christian checklist. We can't be righteous, but God chooses to make us so. I used a fancy word in the last sermon on righteousness, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. I thought about, wait a minute, doesn't, if God is righteous, he gives us to it. There's a word for that, and I had to think about it. Just going back. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, they're called communicable attributes, and that's a weird word. But we, we talk about this word mostly with, with a cold, a virus. We heard it, pandemic, communicable. It can, can be passed on. And I pointed out there's some things, the ones God doesn't pass, the incommunicable. These are just God. And God will always have these. And we won't. Anything with the omni, omnipotent, omnipresent, or those big Big words like immutability, eternal. We, have kind of, we last into eternity, but we have a beginning, so we can't quite be eternal. But righteousness, righteousness, God wants to share that. He wants to not only give it to us as a blessing and to save us, but he wants us to kind of go and then show it in the world. Show off God's character in the right way. Go show people what God is like. We'll get to salt and light pretty soon. But righteousness, God shares, and he shares it that it's purpose. It's purposeful. It gives him joy and delight to see his righteousness get spread. Most things we spread around are bad. But when it comes to the word of God, he's not spreading it thinly. When it comes to righteousness, this gets spread widely and deeply. He shares this quality. Jesus dispenses it, the bringer of righteousness. He preaches and teaches on righteousness, but he also embodies it. If the personal aspect means 
that when God looks at us, he sees Jesus, the purposeful aspect would then be when the world looks at us, they will see, they will encounter Jesus. I really struggle with righteousness. And that's kind of, I think, the best way to think of it is that when somebody will see you, they will see Jesus Christ. I've never thought about righteousness that way, and it's helpful for me. I hope it is for you. Because I, I, I struggle. What does it look like uh, to live for righteousness' sake? Because as I just said, I don't want a big checklist. And that's not good, and that's not helpful. Because that'll be self-righteousness. Hey, I'm really a good guy. I read the Bible every day. <sighs> no. And I hope this conversation kind of continues. I hope we all kind of wrestle with that this week. What does it look like? What does the Bible say? It's, it's kind of not as tangible as I want it to be uh, as I put together a sermon. I stand up here. It's harder to grasp. Each of the fruit of the Spirit, all those, boy, I look at those like, yeah, there's a lot of room for me to grow in each, each fruit, each aspect. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control, to name a couple. Oh, those are hard, and God help me. But I get it with each of those. I know kind of what those mean, what it looks like, how I'd like it to look in my life. Righteousness. That's hard to say. This, this is kind of how I imagine it. God, make it work in these ways. But don't make a legalistic checklist. Don't do that. So what it boils down to is simply, I'd say, having a Christ-like character. And that's hard. Uh, that hits home for me. Dallas Willard uses a phrase, a renovation of the heart. Renovate, he's talking about our, our personality. <laughs> our personality will begin to look like the personality of Jesus Christ. I know my personality type. There's all these different inventories, Myers-Briggs. There's this other thing called the Enneagram. I know a lot of stuff for myself. It's good for you to know this stuff for yourself. But the goal is to have a Christ-like personality. And that's the invitation. Ken Geyer, G-I-R-E, I think that's how you say his name. He's a really wonderful Christian author. Um, I've recently rediscovered him. I'd widely recommend, everyone would love his book called Moments with the Savior. I could just say that. Some books are for some people. But this one would be good for everyone, wherever you are in your life and faith. He takes the stories of Jesus and um, narrates them, just a little longer than a Today devotional, a couple pages. He takes the different events and stories of Jesus and just adds, and I don't mean this in disrespectfully, but what's not in the Gospels, the emotions and some of those sort of novel details. But for all the descriptions he has of characters, how, say, Mary felt in the scene with her brother Lazarus, Mary and Martha, and some of those things he, he uh, expounds upon. But he points this out in this book, Moments with the Savior. For all the descriptions he gives, and this was profound to me, he says, and I knew this, but the way he said it was like, wow. We don't know what Jesus looked like or sounded like. We don't know his hair color. We don't know how long it was. We don't know if he had a beard or if he was clean shaven. It feels like 98% of our depictions, he's got a beard. We don't know. We don't know how tall he was. We don't know how much he weighed. And he pointed out this. If you're asking, what did Jesus look like? What did he look like? Well, this is what he looked like. He was poor in spirit. Though he shared the Father's nature, he did not... Consider equality something to cling to, but he impoverished himself, laying aside the robes of heaven for the rags of humanity. He did this in order to serve us and what it means to be fully human. He mourned as Isaiah prophesied, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, crying over the grave of a friend, weeping over the fate of a nation, feeling the full sorrow of humanity upon the cross. He was meek, riding into Jerusalem on a baby donkey, stooping to shoulder the cares of the down and out, with strength to speak out in defense of the adulterous woman, and the strength to remain silent when he came to defending himself. 
He hungered and thirsted for righteousness so much so that he refused the loaves offered by Satan and on the cross the wine offered him by the soldier. His bread was to do the will of his Father in heaven and his drink the cup offered him in Gethsemane. He was merciful and he moved with compassion on the crowds that flocked around him. Like so many that had longing, fearful sheep, desperate for a shepherd. Wherever Jesus went, he stretched out his hands, gathering them to himself, nourishing them and binding them. He was pure in heart. As Soren Kierkegaard once said, the purity of the heart is to will one thing. That's Jesus' heart. He's a peacemaker coming to reconcile the earth, the prodigal world, the Father's love. And then Ken Geyer sort of asked this about Jesus. I have to kind of just, that's what he looked like. For all his goodness and all his kindness, what did Jesus receive? A pat on the back, recognition, a parade in his honor, a little bit, but not quite. Persecution, that's what. And if the world persecuted him, what would it do to his followers? And if that's the road that Christ-like character takes us down, why, why do it? At the end, he says, beyond the sight of our eyes, a few steps ahead of our logic, past our wildest dreams, lies a majestic kingdom. It's brimming with blessings, comfort for the sadness that we've carried in our hearts, an inheritance that staggers the imagination, a feast to satisfy every inner longing that we've ever had. Mercy to salve every wound that we've encountered along the way. And most exciting of all, the embrace of the Father, welcoming his children home. That's a profound, simple, profound thing. We don't know what Jesus looked like physically. But we know what he looked like by his character. So to be righteous, when it comes to our salvation, that's what God's grace looks like. In all those ways, and you could keep going with that stuff too. But when God looks at us, that's what he sees. That's who he sees, Jesus Christ. When it comes to our, our salvation, that's the gift. And we, we receive it by faith, and faith is not something we do, but it's a gift and a gift to receive the gift. We sort of don't have a choice. That's a very um, Calvinistic perspective that I still hold to. But when it comes to our mission and how shall now we live, a phrase we've heard maybe before, we do have a choice. When it comes to being righteous in this world, we have a choice. We participate. We cooperate. We need to say, I do God helping me, and we need God's help. The Holy Spirit makes us more into the character of Christ. So what do the world see when they see you? Do they see and hear Someone who is right? A lot of Christians are emphatic on this and are, are good at this, which is not good. That you're right in your religious resume. What you do and how you do it, what you think, what you feel, what you believe, and how you think and you feel and believe, not only what, but the way in which you do it is right. Are you right in your interpretation on any given thing? topic, and you're right, and of course, if you're right on that, those things, you've got it all figured out, and you're right, then of course you would be right on every social political aspect. If you have it right with all the God stuff, then everything else comes easy. And I'll put it this way playfully, being a jerk for Jesus will surely get you some pushback. I've seen a lot of people just not being anything different, being self-righteous and then complaining when others kind of ret uh, retaliate in different ways. Think and pray about the fruit of the Spirit. Are you hindered? Is there any roadblocks from preventing you, other than you, from doing and living out the fruit of the Spirit? It's, it's hard for me to say, yeah. I, I know our world isn't conducive and doesn't encourage those things, but... Uh, I think I could only blame myself if I fail to live the fruit of the Spirit. 
If I'm impatient in traffic, that's me and not the other person. I always get mad at the other person, but it's not that person's fault if I'm impatient. You get the picture. So don't confuse any pushback for self-righteousness with persecution. Just like in sports, it's often the biggest, roughest players are the quickest to cry foul. Don't be that Christian. A lot of us spend a lot of life in this realm of rightness. But good news, very good news, relief and repentance. We don't have to live that way. Thank God we don't have to be that way any longer. Jesus Christ has set you free and sets you on a more beautiful path. If you've accepted by faith the work of Jesus Christ, when he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. If you're wondering this about for yourself, I'd love to talk with you more. I don't, I don't know if that's part of my life. It's a good news reminder for all of you, for all of us, is that when God looks at us, he sees Jesus. But what about everyone else? What about your family, your friends, your church, neighbors, strangers, and enemies? We'll get to them. What do they see? Do they see Jesus? Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, we pray that you renew us, mold us into the shape of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you see us as Jesus, and we pray that we would be a people that live out that righteousness in all that we are and all that we do. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand in body or in spirit and sing our song of response this morning, Jesus, draw me ever nearer.
invite our outgoing deacons and elders to come forward. When everyone's here, then I'll say a prayer, and we know how this goes. We entrust God's provision. Okay, let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love and care for your church. I'm grateful for not only um, Andy and Bruce and Bev and Dirk as they go out, but as others who continue to serve and the names that are in our basket here that are willing to serve. And we pray knowing that you provide and trusting um, our not only discernment process, but your, uh, as we cast a lot, knowing that this is, this is your selection as well. And uh, you are God in and through this process. Continue to bless your church, your leadership, and for those who finish uh, a, a joyful finish and a, a time to be grateful for the service and for those coming in, uh, a chance to some of whom will be challenged anew and some who will be taking uh, service perhaps for the first time. Bless us all that we would bless you and uh, your work in the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, Bruce, I'll, I think I'll have everyone grab one and then once we've grabbed them, we'll, I'll have you share who you, we had drew. And caring elder... And this is administrative elder. We kind of put three baskets. Okay, who do we have? Let me see. Deacon Deanne Spielman. Thank you. John Deckinger Jr. That sounds official. The junior. All right, we'll get to Dirk for our Carla Wednar. Carla Wednar for our and Jim Decker. Thank you all. All right, I'm going to give these to the clerk. And I'm going to pray once again uh, as we pray in our congregational prayer. All right, I think that's, thank you all. No Sunday school for kids today. Mr. Sam is away. Uh, tomorrow we're going to have another church lunch. And I've not made this recipe, but it's so far been so good when I've said that. We're going to have... Italian wedding soup and an Italian pasta salad. So everyone, please come out. All are welcome. Um, they've been really fun events, and usually we have a little leftovers, and that's been a great blessing too as we take leftovers to other folks and church and neighbors. So please give that some thought. Um, it's always good, even if you have to eat and run, which a few people do who are working. So please come out for that. Let us turn to God in a time of prayer. Lord Jesus, it's with joy we confess that you are Savior and our Lord, and there is no other Savior and Lord but you. We just finished in a long, over a stretch, your Beatitudes, and so we thank you, just as we think about this, that you speak your divine blessing on us. We're humbled that you love us enough to give us your perspective on what it means to be truly a human being in this, our world. We're humbled that you love us enough to speak your kingdom into our world. We acknowledge that we are indeed poor in spirit, and may this always be our posture before you, so that you're free to do in us that what only you can do. We do mourn over the state of our world. We think especially of its rejection of you. We mourn the things we see in this world, violence escalating in the Middle East, your church that is persecuted, and those who suffer, struggle, and yes, are killed each and every day. There's much in our personal lives that gives us grief. We're not all that you long for us to be, and so we're moved by the realization that you mourn with us and for us, and that your mourning will soon turn into joy and our joy too. We affirm that gentleness is the way, and that you call us to be this way in all of our relationships. In you, we see that the gentle do in fact inherit the goodness of creation. Make us like you. Oh, how we hunger and thirst for you to put things right. We give you thanks for all the ways you are doing this right and this rightness, righteousness now. And we long for the day when your great craving will be fulfilled in a fully righteous world. 
How can we adequately say thank you for your mercy? You are merciful, holy and merciful. So help us to drink your mercy so that we have the strength to extend mercy to all that we encounter. Help us to hear in the brokenness around us the cry, someone have mercy on me. You know that we want to be pure in heart and we confess that we cannot make this happen. We don't achieve this. You, only you, pure one, can make such a miracle in our souls. So dear friend of saviors, make it so. You know how much we want to see you, to see the Father. Makers of shalom, what dignity you bestow upon us. So free us from all that gets in the way with cooperating with you. You and your great work in the world, we pray that you equip us with all the grace that we need to be people of peace. We want to be known as children of the peacemaking God in all the places we live and work. And Jesus, we know that we, as we seek to live in sync with you and your agenda in this age, we could find ourselves in trouble. We would rather it not, but we thank you for warning us and making it clear why this happens. Should we be persecuted on account of you, please work in us so that we could even be like Stephen who when being unjustly stoned followed your lead in prayer. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. As we look at the Beatitudes, it's not just a to-do list or even a really good character list. It shows us you, and so we praise you. There is simply none like you. We thank you as we can pray together and for each other, and we pray through our church uh, directory, we thank you for the Seamer family, and we pray for Phil and Angela and Elliot and Isaac. We pray for Angela and her work as an advocate at Oak Lawn Children's Hospital. Give her strength and energy, and we pray that she'd be grace in that setting. I pray for Phil and Elliot and Isaac at school. What probably feels like work for all of them, but it's work for one of them. Bless Principal Seamer and his work of being a gracious presence handling a number of challenging things in this day and age. Continue to bless Elliot and Isaac, and they would grow in knowing you and give them days of joy in school too. We pray for the Spielmans, for Ken and Deanne. Ken prays for safe travels as he heads home. We pray for Deanne, now she will serve as a deacon. Uh, we, we pray for, uh, as well, our new selectees, our, our new council members for uh, John and um, Carla and Jim, and uh, pray for your blessing as they begin this work. We continue to pray, uh, as we've been praying already this week, for Carolyn Hallen and her family. We pray for Carolyn and what's just been a really hard, discouraging time, especially for her family. Continue to give them answers and grace in these frustrating uh, really discouraging, disheartening moments with dementia and an uncooperative spirit. Uh, we pray for her daughter as well who broke her leg. Bring her healing and patience. We continue to pray for Dave Lechnerberg following his surgery and the level of pain that he feels. Continue to give him strength and courage and that balance of rest and strength in the weeks ahead. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts of being your people, for the simple things we can enjoy with worship fellowship, service. So as we go now from this place, we pray that we would not take the gift you've given us lightly or arrogantly, but to hold it and extend it with graciousness. Give us the character of Christ in all that we are and all that we do. Receive our offerings and bless the work of Thrive for e abuse awareness. Continue to bring healing and uh, preventiveness in uh, the churches. We pray this grace. And we pray this in all of our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our beautiful Savior. Amen. I pray that offering will be for um, Thrive, which is a larger umbrella in the Christian Reformed Church. Uh, and one of the things under that umbrella is abuse awareness. So may we give in that particular cause with thankful hearts. I invite you to stand and receive God's blessing. Go to be God's loving presence in the world and his presence goes with you and, and before you.
The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace today and in all of your days. Amen. Our sending song this morning is Around. Um, I'd like to invite us to do it all together, go through it once, and then we'll split into two parts. We'll have this side, follow me, and we'll start, and then that side will follow Carol and Morgan. And uh, when we do it in a round, we'll go through it twice. So we'll go through it once together, we'll pause, and then we'll do it as a round. Mm -hmm. 